All right, it is 5.42 p.m. on uh, Tuesday, June 2nd, 2020. And I am calling to order an informal public hearing pursuant to Urbana City Code Section 1282 D&E regarding an appeal of an initial determination of lack of jurisdiction in case number 0010520. And uh, would the clerk please call the roll, if you would. Peter Resnick. Here. Marion Knight. Here. Rizwan Uden. Here. James Simon. Here. Christopher Hansen. Here. Thank you. So um, I put on the agenda a little quick chair's introduction. That all seemed very official, and that's because this is an official open meeting, and so we have to abide by minute taking and all of the other open meetings requirements. But this is officially an informal hearing. So uh, there's not going to be Robert's Rules of Order or things like this as we go. Um, so we will have minutes, we will have the recording, um, and we will have public comments to satisfy the open meetings requirement. That'll come after the, uh, um, the Q&A by the hearing body members. Um, so to my left is Marion Knight, uh, former chair of the HRC some years ago. Uh, to my right, Rizwan Yudin, who is also on the Human Relations Commission, and myself, Pete Resnick, will be the hearing body for this hearing. And then we have uh, James Simon, who is the city attorney, who is the acting officer for purposes of the hearing. And we have uh, Christopher Hansen, who is the complainant and the appellant in this case. Um, so. This hearing, the finding of the officer was that there was no jurisdiction in the case, and so this is an appeal strictly on the question of jurisdiction, so whether or not there's jurisdiction. So we're not going to be speaking about the particulars of the case of the complaint that was made, but more on the question of jurisdiction. Um, because the, the ordinance requires confidentiality for lots of stuff that's not in the uh, uh, public hearing, um, I talked to everybody and uh, both of the parties here, we agreed that we're going to refer to the respondent as the respondent or use their title if that's needed, uh, but try and avoid using names just especially because it's about jurisdiction. The particulars of the person are not terribly important. Um, the presenters have agreed to a maximum of 20 minutes each split. We'll do the officer will present for 15 minutes, up to 15 minutes. Uh, regarding their findings um, or their, you know, their initial determination. Then the appellant will speak up to 20 minutes and then the officer will have an extra five minutes if desired for a reply. Um, we did invite, uh, as per requirement of the ordinance, we did invite the respondent if um, they wanted to come and speak to this. They declined to do so and so that's fine. They're not required to be here. Um, so we're going to hold comments from the hearing body until after the presentations are done. Um, so we'll just let you all speak to what you want to speak to, and then we'll ask, you know, we'll do a Q&A after that. And then after our Q&A, we'll do the public input. And I'll talk about public input when we get to it uh, regarding how we're going to run that pretty normally, just like you would for a city council meeting or something. Um, and since this is only about jurisdiction, we don't have to talk about particulars of, you know, uh, details of the complaint. The plan is to do our deliberations in open session, uh, that we're not going to go into closed session. If either, if any of the hearing body feel that closed session is needed for any particular question, we would have to make the motion and follow the um, uh, Open Meetings Act rules on that. But for the time being, I don't see a reason to do so. With that, um, why don't we start, Mr. Simon, uh, give us uh, your statement of reasons for your determination. Thank you. As the panel chair indicated, I am James Simon. I am the city attorney for the city of Urbana. On May 6, Mr. Hansen filed a complaint with the Commission on Human Relations, often referred to as the HRC or the Human Relations Commission. So I'll probably use all three designations if that's okay. Essentially, the complaint alleges that a city employee discriminated against Mr. Hansen based on skin color when denying him access 
to so-called public accommodations allegedly provided by the city. He, a little slightly deeper dive, alleges that the employee acted improperly, contrary to the ordinance, when acting as a so-called gatekeeper. That's his term in his complaint. And the gatekeeper issue was that the employee was not processing, allegedly, his complaints under both the city's civilian police review board ordinance, CPRB ordinance, and the human rights ordinance, or HR ordinance. Normally, as uh, the chair indicated, the, this particular employee would conduct the investigation by reason of the employee's role with the city. Obviously, that presented a conflict. The mayor designated me to serve as the investigative officer, and that's why I'm here, and that's why I ultimately issued my determination and my order dismissing the complaint. Several days prior to May 13, 2020, I undertook my duties as investigator. I carefully reviewed and analyzed the human rights ordinance. I reviewed the complaint, and I also conducted some legal research. On May 13, I issued uh, my initial determination and my order, and I concluded, one, that the Human Rights Commission lacks jurisdiction because the ordinance does not apply to the city or city staff. I also found that the Human Rights Ordinance and the CPRB Ordinance are not, quote, public accommodations, unquote, as defined in the Human Rights Ordinance. Based on that, lack of jurisdiction and not fitting any kind of a alleged charge or claim within one of the areas of the ordinance, I issued an initial order dismissing the complaint I made no investigation of, and nor did I make any determination of probable cause, because even if I had, I believe the HRC would not have the jurisdiction to hear that. Well, there are a couple of issues. Let's start with the jurisdictional issue. Urbana City Code Section 12-82 paren C states, if the officer, me, finds with respect to any respondent that the commission lacks jurisdiction or that probable cause does not exist, the officer shall issue and cause to be served on the respondent and the complaint in order dismissing the allegations of the complaint. I found there was no jurisdiction and therefore I issued the order and it was sent to both Mr. Hansen and the employee. Obviously the basis for my finding is that I do not believe the ordinance applies to the city or its employees. There is no dispute that the respondent is an employee of the city and in fact Mr. Hansen alleges that. We don't dispute that. Urbana City Code 12105 provides four instances over which the HRC would have no jurisdiction. 12-105 paren D is the one that I relied on. That provision states, quote, the provisions of this article shall not apply to other units of government, including federal government or any of its agencies, the state of Illinois, and any other political subdivisions, municipal corporations, or their agencies. The city is a political subdivision of the state. The city is a municipal corporation. Undoubtedly, Mr. Hansen will question the, the word other as it appears actually twice in section 105 paren D. As I read the applicable section on jurisdiction, I read it as not other meaning excluding the city from the exemption, the exception, but other meaning in addition to the city, these other units of government uh, do not, are, are not subject to the 
a HR ordinance. I think it's a reasonable interpretation because if the ordinance intended, was intended to apply to the city as well as its employees, there would ha be no need to include the word other. It would just simply say it's not applicable or it is applicable to municipal corporations, etc. The ordinance would have just listed the government agencies and could have included the city itself. The ordinance did not include the city. So I have read other to mean in addition to the city and its employees. Mr. Hansen will likely cite to section 12101 which gives the HRC the authority to impose fines on the city and its employees up to $500. At, it would have to be after a formal hearing, not one of these hearings. A and the alleged discriminatory conduct would have to be demonstrated. Finding the city, frankly, makes no sense. What would happen? The city would take the money, let's say it's a $500 fine, out of one pocket and put it back right in that same pocket. It wouldn't even put it in the other pocket because the money would come out of the general operating fund and go right back into the general operating fund. In short, the impact on the city would be a nullity. Finding the employee directly also makes no sense. Urbana City Code 2-173 requires the city to indemnify and defend the employee unless the city attorney, me at this point, declines to represent an employee named as a defendant in a proceeding that is civil in nature. And that's basically what an HRC uh, proceeding would be civil in nature. Uh, the city is obligated to defend and indemnify the employee for any monetary damages assessed against the employee. So once again, the city would be taking money out of the operating fund, general operating fund, and putting it right back in the general operating fund. The city attorney's decision whether to defend an employee is based on whether the city attorney determines that the employee's conduct was intentional, willful, wanton, or grossly negligent, or that the conduct was not related to that employee's assigned duties. The criteria for establishing that are the type of work the employee performed and whether the work in question that the employee performed, that is in question here, was motivated at least in part to serve the city. As city attorney, I determined the employee's conduct was not intentional, willful, wanton, or grossly negligent using a legal standard. That's a phrase, and each one of those elements is a concept in the law. I found no case that would suggest what the employee did constituted intentional, willful, wanton, or grossly negligent conduct. The employee's job included screening complaints for under the CPRB ordinance and the HRO ordinance. The employee made a reasonable effort to deal with those complaints pursuant to that ordinance and therefore the employee performed that individual's job. Whether Mr. Hansen likes the outcome or whether I like the outcome is immaterial. The employee did the employee's job. Section 12-86B6 says nothing in this article shall be construed to permit compensatory damages to equal, to equal more than the actual monetary losses or costs incurred by the complainant as a result of the discriminator, discrimination by the respondent. I didn't see any alleged costs in the complaint. Mr. Hansen, uh, its argument would also place the commission in a very untenable situation, probably to the extent it would not be able to do its job. Uh, Urbana City Code Section 12-17 provides that the mayor, with the advice and consent of the city council, appoints the HRC members. 
Section 12-22 provides that the HRC is charged with cooperating with the mayor, <clears throat> city council, city departments in securing the furnishings of equal services to all residents. They have to cooperate and work with each other. I'll get back to that one a little bit later. Services of all city departments and agencies must be made available to the HRC at its request. It is unlikely that people, employees at the city would be willing to work for and cooperate with or staff the HRC if they knew they would be subject to the whim of an unfounded complaint or a whole group of complaints. The human rights and CPRB ordinances do not constitute public accommodations as that phrase is defined in the Human Rights Act, excuse me, Human Rights Ordinance. Urbana City Code Section 1239 defines public accommodations as <clears throat> pub, uh, places, businesses, or individuals offering goods, services, or accommodations to the public. The city is not a place, it's a government. It's not a business, it's a government, and it's not an individual it's a political entity. Generally, it doesn't peddle goods. Mr. Hansen will contend that it peddles services, but they are not public accommodations. Black's Law Dictionary, the most recent one, defines public accommodations as the provision of lodging, food, entertainment, other services to the public, especially as defined in the Civil Rights Act of 1964, one that affects interstate commerce or is support by state, supported by state action. This is not an issue of state action. A business that provides such amenities to the general public is the second definition. City government is not a business. So anywhere in the human rights ordinance where the phrase public accommodations appears, that definition applies. You have about three minutes left for this. Okay. Uh, Urbana City Code 12-63A uh, essentially prohibits, dis in terms of public accommodations, uh, charging a higher price than regular or denying full and equal enjoyment of goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages, and accommodations of any public accommodation or that an individual's patron of or present at a public accommodation is objectionable Ob objectionable, unwelcome, unacceptable, and undesirable. It's a long stretch to say that a statute or an ordinance is a public accommodation. It is a long stretch to say that the city provides public accommodations even in the common sense approach. Generally applies to hotels, motels, restaurants, bars, those kinds of things. Mr. Hansen doesn't allege he's been charged a higher price than what he otherwise might have been charged. He's not been denied the full uh, equal enjoyment of goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages, and accommodations, or that his patronage or presence has been objected to or denied. But even if you decide to view Mr. Hansen's definition of public accommodation, he still has not demonstrated jurisdiction. Why? He regularly attends and provides public input at City Council and Committee of the Whole meetings. He has submitted this complaint and it's working its way through the process according to the ordinance. He has submitted numerous human rights and CPRB ordinance complaints. To my understanding at last count they've been about 30 and they have been processed according to the ordinance. What he doesn't like is the outcome of the processing. The determinations were made in accordance with the ordinance. He just happens not to like those determinations. His complaints were rejected because of one or more reasons, lack of jurisdiction, or they were unfounded, or the allegations didn't fit within the scope of that particular ordinance under which it was brought. He has submitted FOIA requests, endless number of FOIA requests. Let me pause you now. I, and one of the things we talked about was that this hearing is about jurisdiction. 
Yep. And, and both in your comment about not finding wanton, willful, or negligent conduct and this part about Mr. Hansen's motivations, we're not talking about jurisdiction. So well, shall I, we move on from that, if you could? Well, what I was going to say, basically, is what Mr. Hansen wants, including from a jurisdictional perspective, is that that old adage, every person has a right to their day in court. It doesn't mean that they have the right to a trial or a hearing. It doesn't mean they have the right to prevail. He has a remedy, a very good available, two of them in fact. He could file a complaint with the Illinois Department of Human Rights under the Illinois Human Rights Act, if he thinks, because they would have jurisdiction. Or he could file a civil rights action under Title VII or some other allegation of discrimination beyond Title VII. I don't think, frankly, I don't think the HRC has jurisdiction, and I do believe that public accommodations is part of that analysis, but I will respect uh, the Chair's admonition. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hansen, you have 20 minutes. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Hi, my name is Christopher Hansen. I've lived in Urbana for about uh, 18 years now. Went to college here and stayed. Um, it was my impression coming here that uh, the discussion was going to be limited to the text and intent of the Human Rights Ordinance, um, but now I feel compelled to respond to some things of a personal nature. Uh, and Mr. Hansen? Yes. The purpose of my pointing this out to Mr. Simon and I understand he said these things, but th this was multi-purpose. One was to stop him from continuing. One was to remind everybody up here that those things are irrelevant and we're going to ignore them. The other is we don't need to discuss them further. So let's please stick to the jurisdiction issue. Um, yeah. And I hope everybody understands that those items that I pointed out are simply not relevant and we're going to um, remove them from our thoughts. I trust the panel to do that, but it, it isn't the case that they're not just irrelevant, it's the case that they might be wrong. So uh, and um, when I say they're not relevant to any of us, um, it, for purposes of this discussion, we can assume they're wrong or right, it doesn't matter. And so I really, I, I'm happy to grant you that in your opinion and maybe in many others, they're wrong, and Mr. Simon may disagree, but I think we don't really want to dwell on those issues. Let, let's stick to the jurisdiction and go from there. I agree, and I will endeavor. Um, Thanks. The, uh, I've, sure, yeah, I'm just trying to find my place now. Um, I, I, will, I will correct some items which are not personal, but uh, were mentioned. Uh, Mr. Simon had mentioned uh, multiple times that my complaint um, against the respondent was unfounded. He started his dialogue by saying that he did not investigate that complaint. Um, so I don't repeat, appreciate him repeating that it was unfounded when he says himself he hasn't investigated it. Uh, he also, this is, the, this is the first human rights complaint that I've ever submitted to the city of Urbana, by the way. He had mentioned that uh, my complaint was based on skin color. In fact, that was only uttered once in my complaint. I also mentioned in my complaint that there were other mechanisms of discrimination and retaliation as well. So those things are in play. I'm currently pursuing more records regarding those details, but Mr. Simon has denied many of them. And I will note that by the HR ordinance, a complainant is not required to assert any specifically listed category. Discrimination takes place when someone categorizes or classifies a person rather than eval evaluating a person's unique qualifications relevant to an opportunity that's written in the ordinance. In regards to city services, such as CPRB complaints, the only unique qualification that is required is that the complainant is a human being. So, on to uh, Mr. Simon's points. 
His first point is that, quote, the commission lacks jurisdiction when the city and or one of its employees is a respondent to an HR ordinance com complaint. Mr. Simon writes, quote, the HR ordinance, however, clearly contemplates that it was not intended to be applicable to matters where the city and or one of its employees is a respondent. The human rights ordinance does not clearly contemplate any of the specifics of any entities or people which it was designed to cover. The ordinance does not mention Walmart, Busey Bank, Crane Alley, or Holiday Inn. The ordinance does not mention restaurants, stores, bars, banks, hotels, or even use any of those words. What the ordinance does do is cast a very wide net, and it does not limit itself to any specific categories. The ordinance says that it is applicable to, quote, all places, businesses, or individuals offering goods, services, or accommodations to the general public. Mr. Simon argues that the HRO reads, quote, the provisions of this article shall not apply to any other units of government, including the federal government or any of its agencies, the state of Illinois, and to any other political subdivision, municipal corporation, or their agencies. Mr. Simon has interpreted this to mean that the HRO doesn't apply to the Urbana government. This sentence clearly means exactly what it says. The HRO does not apply to other governmental entities, for example, the federal courthouse or the post office, which reside within Urbana. Furthermore, the Human Rights Ordinance does not explicitly indicate that the HRC, HRC has jurisdiction, sorry, the city, city, sorry, the Human Rights Ordinance does explicitly indicate that the HRC has jurisdiction in matters involving the city and city employees. Section 12-22 indicates that the HRC is tasked, quote, with training city employees and, end quote, and, quote, and maintaining equality of opportunity for employment and advances in the city government, end quote. If it was the if the HRO ordinance actually intended that it would not apply to city employees, it would simply say so in plain language. I cannot believe that when this ordinance was crafted, the intention was that city employees would be exempt and be allowed to discriminate against residents in the performance of their public duties. Mr. Simon argues that the HRO can't apply to city employees because the ordinance indicates a $500 fine for violations and that the city paying itself a $500 fine might cause some kind of unf unfathomable paradox. The Human Rights Ordinance was never intended to be a revenue-producing legislation. The ordinance has nothing to do with revenue and everything to do with equal access. The issue of a fine is a red herring, and if this aspect of Simon's denial must be discussed, then my response is that I see no reason that a city employee couldn't be made to pay the, pay the fine out of pocket to the city. And Mr. Simon said himself that could actually be done if only for the theater of it. I'm not in this matter for money. I just want to improve the government. Mr. Simon said in regards to the issuance of a fine that, quote, the implication would be a nullity, end quote. I don't think that enforcing and maintaining equal access to services is to be seen as a nullity. Mr. Simon concludes his jurisdiction, jurisdiction argument by stating that a civilian group reviewing the actions of a city employee would present an irreconcilable conflict of interest. Quote, quote Mr. Simon, to accept Mr. Hansen's contentions that the commission has jurisdiction over matters in which the city or one of its employees is the intended respondent would place the commission in an untenable conflict of interest with the city and its employees, end quote. I find this claim coming from the city attorney to be rather remarkable, and I wonder if Mr. Simon has heard of the Urbana Civilian Police Review Board, a city board designed with the sole intent of reviewing and correcting the actions of city employees. Mr. Simon goes on to list four points regarding the conflict of interest with the Human Relations Commission. Number one, quote, the mayor with the advice and consent of the city council appoints the members of the commission, end quote. That's true. That's also precisely true for the Urbana Civilian Police Review Board. Mr. Simon's point number two, quote, the city provides staff support to the commission, end quote. That's true. That's also precisely the case with the CPRB. 
Point number three, quote, the commission is charged with cooperating with the mayor, city council, city departments, agencies, and officials, end quote. That's entirely true, and that is also exactly the case with the CPRB. Mr. Simon's point number four, quote, the services of all city departments and agencies shall be made available to the commission at its request. Clearly, the commission cannot take jurisdiction over a matter in which the city or one of its employees has responded while cooperating at the same time, end quote. This does not describe a circumstance or conflict any different than might be encountered by the Civilian Police Review Board. Furthermore, if a human rights complaint is made against a city employee because that employee is dysfunctional in their official capacity, it is already the case that the HRC cannot rely on that city resource and the problem still needs to be dealt with. By not allowing a complaint against a city employee to be investigated, the long-term effect would be to create an even worse internal conflict. The HRC would be forever operating with the suggestion of impropriety by one of the very resources on which it relies. The HRC must investigate complaints against city employees if only to ensure that its own tools are sound and trustworthy. Furthermore, if we look at the Civilian Police Review Board Ordinance, we find that it clearly makes reference back to the HRO in regards to retaliation. The CPRB ordinance predicts that when someone files a complaint against the police, there is a good chance for those city employees to retaliate against the complainant. If that happens, it is the task of the HRO and the HRC to investigate that retaliation and the resulting complaint. The very simple fact is the reason that we have civilian review boards like the HRC and the CPRB is because we recognize the tendency for in institutions to fail internally. By leaving this matter to internal mechanisms, the conflict of interest quandary cited by Mr. Simon is substantially worse. Mr. Simon's uh, second reason for denial uh, quote, the complainant, the complaint does not allege conduct that falls within the ordinance section on discrimination in public accommodations, end quote. Uh, this argument on its face has no meaning. A complaint is not required to prove that their complaint is related to pub public accommodations or any specific category. Section 12-22B7 of the HRO says, quote, the purposes of the Human Relations Commission shall be to receive and investigate complaints involving discrimination as defined, but not limited to the protections of this chapter. Section 12-37 of the HRO ordinance says, quote, it is the intent of the city of Urbana in adopting this article to secure an end in the city to discrimination, including, but not limited to, an opportunity in housing employment credit or public accommodations, not limited to. Section 12-61A of the HRO ordinance says, quote, every individual shall be afforded the opportunity to, to participate fully in the economic, cultural, and intellectual life that is available in the city, which shall include, but not be limited to, opportunities in employment, housing, housing places of a public, public accommodation, and credit or commercial transactions, not limited to. Again, there is no indication at the HR, in the HRO that the complainant must prove that the complaint is in regards to public accommodation or any specific category. If we must argue about the definition of public accommodations, then I still find that the definition provided within the ordinance does include city services. The definition of public accommodations in the HRO ordinance is, quote, all places, businesses, or individuals offering goods, services, or accommodations to the general public, end quote. I simply do not see how this definition precludes something like access to city services. I also find no reason to accept any alternate definition to the phrase public accommodations as provided by Mr. Simon, because the phrase is clearly defined within the HRO under the section titled definitions. I believe the reason that Mr. Simon attempted to put forth a different definition from the law dictionary of his choice is because Mr. Simon himself does not believe that the HRO definition precludes city services. Once again, there is nothing more, this is nothing more than an academic discussion because the complainant is not required to prove that the complaint is in, repart, in regards to public accommodations or any other specific category. Um, I'll close by reciting uh, uh, three portions of the Human Rights Ordinance. Uh, 
Section 12-22A, quote, the Commission on Human Relations shall co cooperate with the Mayor, City Council, City Departments, agencies, and officials in securing the furnishings of equal services to all residents, end quote. Section 12-22B5, the purposes, the purposes of the Human Relations Commission shall be to cooperate with the mayor, city, city council, city departments, agencies, and officials in establishing and maintain, maintaining a good community relations and securing the furnishings of equal services to all residents, end quote. Section 12-22B7, the purposes of the Human Relations Commission shall be to receive and investigate complaints involving discrimination as defined but not limited to the protections of this chapter. I don't want to have to go to court. I don't think that's a helpful suggestion. I think the reason the HRC was established is to settle these matters more accessibly for citizens and by the people of Urbana who are appointed to deal with such things. I, I, I think the suggestion that I should go to court is, is offensive. Um, I was going to close there, but uh, I happen to see that Mayor Marlin and Elizabeth Hannon are joining the meeting today, and I would like to strongly encourage both of them uh, as the Mayor and Human Resources Director to participate in public comment today and uh, issue your opinion on if you think City of Urbana employees should be allowed to discriminate without restriction in the City of Urbana or if your employees should be bound uh, to the same standards of ethics as everyone else. Thank you. Thank you and uh, very efficiently done. Uh, all right, so you have up to five minutes for any replies you think are useful. I doubt I will take the full five minutes. Uh, Mr. Hansen's uh, discussion of the CPRB ordinance is wholly irrelevant. That is an ordinance which on its face clearly contemplates and recognizes possible conflict between the CPRB board as well as, and the police department. That's what the whole ordinance is about to review specifically employee police officers. There's no specification like that in the Human Rights Ordinance. It doesn't work that way. The CPRB rules ordinance has no relationship whatsoever to whether or not Mr. Hansen has demonstrated jurisdiction. Now, I note that the commission allowed Mr. Hansen to or excuse me, the panel allowed Mr. Hansen to discuss public accommodations, but I will honor the chair's direction and I won't rebuttal against that. I'm sorry, against what? I was getting into public accommodation and you stopped me there and said it's limited to jurisdiction. Sorry, and, and um, if you want to use a couple of minutes, not that public accommodations was, was somehow excluded from the question, the definition of public accommodations, but um, m my concern was that at the time you had mentioned not liking outcomes, that you were talking about motives behind his use of public accommodations. No, I, I was trying to explain that even if one accepted that the HRO O and CPRB ordinances are public accommodations, which I don't believe they are, but even if you did, I was illustrating that he has, in fact, ah. received accommodation at the, quote, public accommodation. I don't believe city services are contemplated as public accommodation. And Mr. Hansen's complaint uh, focuses on the concept of public accommodation okay. and now he's shifting his analysis. I can only go by what was written in his complaint and it was focused exclusively on public accommodation. The fact is I do not believe reading the ordinance and interpreting it with fair interpretation that this ordinance was designed to be a, unlike the CPRB, which was specifically designed to uh, deal with employee conduct. I don't believe this one is. I believe the phrase other could reasonably be interpreted as I have to mean in addition to. And I will end it there.
All right, thank you. All right, our next uh, step is questions from the panel for either of the parties. Um, I can start to my left. Marion, do you have any questions for folks? No, I don't. All right. Uh, Rizwan, do you have any? Simon. Uh, sorry. Uh, that somebody in the position of uh, Mr. Hansen would be able to take. Uh, you mentioned two avenues that he can approach the Illinois um, uh, Department. Well, the Illinois Department of Human Rights. And the Department of State Human Rights. Are there any other I'm sorry, Mr. Uden, can you make sure your microphone is on? Oh, your microphone is on. Ah. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. So let me, let me re re repeat the question. Um, question for Mr. Simon, that uh, in addition to the two avenues that you mentioned, are there other avenues where the matter that uh, has been brought to, this, to the city's office can be raised? Are you asking? In a, in a more appropriate setting. Uh, meaning in a city environment there are two easier very relevant settings without going to court as I said he could file a claim or a charge with the Illinois Department of Human Rights that's the investigatory body and if it isn't resolved there through conciliation in fact this uh, also offers conciliation our ordinance uh, then it would go to the Commission, Illinois Human Rights Commission, which would be more or less the hearing body. He could also file a complaint with the EEOC if he feels he has been discriminated against. I don't believe either of them cost him anything more than this kind of a proceeding. Like this, they just take time. Anything else? No. I, I, I've got a few, of course, because I'm the uh, ordinance geek. Um, I've got a few questions for each of you. Um, so, uh, Mr. Simon, I was looking at the definitions in 1239. And so, um, people can be, uh, the people who this ordinance applies to are like employers, um, owners of real estate, and um, uh, public accommodations. But let, let's take owner of real estate, and it says any person who holds legal, equitable title to, et cetera, and so forth. And person is specifically defined in the ordinance as one or more individuals, labor unions, et cetera, and so forth. And at the end of the list is government agency, trustees, owner, or any agent representative of the foregoing. Well, if government agency is listed there as one of the possible people who could violate the ordinance, um, what government agency would that be, given your interpretation of the latter. I think there's a conflict in the ordinance. I think the ordinance creates its own conflict because obviously governments, including the federal government, including the state, including agencies of the state, including agencies, though they hold title in the name of, the, of their government, not their agency, uh, as well as municipalities and uh, body politics, municipal corporations, etc., subdivisions of the state, they own real estate. The sanitary district owns real estate. Champaign owns real estate. Uh, Cusswords, uh, Champaign-Urbana solid waste disposal system owns real estate. So, but there's a conflict in the ordinance. So it, you, you, you take this as just a simple contradiction, a drafting error, someone included yes. a part here and not there. Yes. And because it doesn't say the city owned property. It, that is a broad uh, provision that would run contrary to the exceptions, I believe it was in 102. Okay, um, the other two bits I had for you, um, in, you, you mentioned fines and that it would be untenable or just kind of silly to, for the city to fine itself. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, um, I, I didn't say untenable, I said but it didn't make sense. There, there are a list of other remedies should we find discrimination in 1284.5 like um, for instance, we can 
uh, force someone to rehire an employee. Uh, we can for you know, the the commission could um, you know ask for uh, a labor union to take on this person. Um, could require the person to get housing e in each of the categories, and it mentions public accommodations. Wouldn't, for instance, an employment thing apply to the city? that the HRC could conceivably order the city to rehire this person who they discriminatorily fired? The only, well, I believe it couldn't. We had that exact situation a number of years ago in, I think it was 2013, where an employee uh, was not going to be reappointed, and I won't mention the employee's name. The matter was successfully resolved, and it was determined not only by me, but outside counsel that was asked the very specific question that is raised here. Does the HRC have jurisdiction? And outside counsel reviewed the ordinance very carefully and concluded exactly as I concluded. All right. One last one. Um, uh, for purposes of the ordinance, you mentioned something about the city is not an individual, um, uh, you know, for purposes of right. jurisdiction. I, is the respondent an individual for purposes of jurisdiction? I, th I think the respond a respondent is an individual. And, but and being an employee of the city, I do not believe the ordinance would apply to that individual. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Hansen, I had one or two for you. Um, you had mentioned that a fine could be done out of pocket for the employee, but um, the, Mr. Simon's concern was, well, but the city indemnifies employees for their behavior anyway, so the city would end up paying that fine to itself. Um, I, the, the fine thing seems to me somewhat convincing, but I was wondering, is there some avenue where the fine makes sense? I'm not sure it matters. I'm, I'm just yeah, wondering, it, since it, you brought it up. To me, it, it well, I didn't bring it up. Mr. Simon brought right. it up. Right. No, his. but I, you um, responded to it. I just wanted to find right. out if there was any well, particular. Well, I responded to it only to point out how silly it is. Uh, I, I don't. I couldn't care less if the respondent is fined in this particular case, or, or really any case at the it's HRC about the hears. provision of service. I want to correct the discrimination. Okay. That that's kind of what I thought, but I just wanted to confirm. Um, the places in the ordinance where you mentioned the phrase not limited to, mm -hmm. um, my impression in reading over each one was that the not limited to applied to the type of discrimination that they were talking about, you know, um, uh, including but not limited to race, uh, color, religion, et cetera, and so forth, but not any particular kind of act. It was any particular kind of discrimination. Did I miss one? Um, I'm, let me look it up really quick. I, I know what you're, which one you're referring to. Okay. Okay, so I believe you're looking at uh, Division One generally, Section 12-37, Intent and Purpose. Is that right? Right. Okay. And, and there were a couple of other citations you gave. Uh, yeah, I'll give those. In, and, but yeah. yeah. I'll give those in a moment. Um, so, so you're finding that in the first, well, uh, m maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll start reading into it. Section 12-37, Intent and Purpose. It is the intent of the city of Urbana in adopting this article to secure an end in the city to discrimination, including but not limited to discrimination by reason of race, color, and then it goes on with a, right. a fairly so long I list. Right, so I took the not limited to to be about the categories Right. Not the so I guess the question I think you're asking is, as that list continues, it, it ends with, or any discrimi discrimination based upon categorizing or classifying a person rather than evaluating a person's unique qualifications relevant to an opportunity in housing employment credit. Right. And, and it, so does the but not limited to apply to the, um, the, the housing not credit and so on? I read it to just simply be about right. the... the I, I could see how you could read it that way because it... it says not limited to, and then it goes on to provide two separable lists. Um, my reading is that it does apply, and based on the other portions of the ordinance, which I can cite now, it absolutely is, is applying itself to the first and second list. Gotcha. And I can, let's, I can uh, more carefully cite those other uh, points. Yeah, I think I, um, I caught most of them. Uh, okay, so uh, back to accommodations. 
Okay, well, sure. well first of all, there's a in section 12-22B7. Right, that was the first one I found. That is a, that is a statement that applies to the entire chapter. So it says, quote, receive and investigate complaints involving discrimination as defined but not limited to the protections of this chapter. So that casts the widest net of all in the entire gotcha. ordinance. It says, according to the entire chapter, that complaints and the types of complaints are not limited. And okay. then the next uh, right, Then was the 1237, and then yeah. it was the one in 1260, no, and, uh, 12. 1261A. Uh, 1261, let me get there. A, you said? Yes. Shall I read it? Uh, I got it in front of me. I, Shall we read uh, it for the people listening? But not limited to opportunities, employment, housing. Got it. Got it. Got it. Interesting. 1261. Okay. Um, did I have any others? Oh, so the last one. Um, so you talked about the uh, definition of public accommodation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it says all places, which we're not talking about here, businesses, which we're not talking about here, or individuals. And so I assume the respondent in this case, you would consider an individual uh, um, for purposes of public accommodation. Well, it, it depends on, uh, it, it depends on the nature of the surface. Uh, sur service, it, all, if you consider all places, individuals and services, so three, three things from that list, those places, individuals and services could easily uh, places, represent businesses and indivi or individuals. Yes, but I'm, I'm choosing three that I'm claiming may represent an instance of something. Ah, uh, um, I see how you're reading it. It would be okay. it would be hard for someone to claim discrimination against a, uh, a a observer at a restaurant without there first being the restaurant and the notion of service Got and it. the server themselves. Got so it. So the the city provides those services through that individual. Yeah, I, I think you'd struggle to have an instance without multiple of that list. Uh, the, the reason I asked is the way it seems to be phrased is you've got a place, a business, or an individual that offers these goods. Ah, uh, I see. Um, and so, all right. I, I think I understand where, what, where you're coming from. And I'd that. like to remind one more time that multiple parts of the ordinance indicate that the complainant does not have to say or argue or complain that they were uh, discriminated against in regards to a public accommodation or any other specific category. But I'm happy to discuss the definition of public nope, accommodation. I just that, don't think it matters. That helps. Thank you. Um, was there anything else I had? And, and, and no other questions from the other two of you? Um, oh. So, well, um, I, I went and did a bit of hunting uh, in the city ordinance, uh, in the city code, just to find if there were any other occurrence of the words other units of government. Um, and I found one instance, uh, and, and I don't, do you have uh, online access? I, yeah, I do. So in section 2103C, so chapter 20, public right away, um, and section 103, which talks about fees. And um, so this is you know paying fees for right of way and things like this. And it said other units of government are exempt from the permit fee. And in context, that one reads to me as other units of government except Urbana because it doesn't apply to Urbana at all. It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. which sort of parallels Mr. Simon's argument that maybe the reason they put in other units of government is because there was this presumption <coughs> that it didn't make any sense for this to apply to Urbana. Um, or it was a copy and paste and that was the phrase they used for other units of government. Um, did, so, could you talk about that just for a second if you yeah, would? Um, I still haven't pulled it up here. And, and I can read it to you. It, it, it's, not terribly exciting. Other units of government are exempt from the permit fees, what it says. Telecommunication service providers that are exempt from charges, and it goes on like that. 
I, I guess my first question would be, is there state or federal law that requires that the city exempt those other units? Well, but, um, oh, well, that, I see what you're saying. Um, right. And so it may just be stating a, the, the condition of some other laws or something. Right. It depends I, on what the meaning is. Fair I mean, enough. We're, we're not, as far as I know, Mr. Simon and I and do not have an argument over the fact that other units of government are exempt from the right. HRO Right. It's, it's whether other so means I, in addition to or I'm, other means um, other than Urbana. Right. And it's not clear to me how the, the other, in, the, the instance that you found in a different part of the city code helps answer that question. I, I'm not sure it does, but <laughs> I found it and I was just wondering if it had any ring to you. Um, I think that's it for my questions. Anybody else? No? All right, so now at this point, we're gonna do um, public input. Um, and so um, let me just give you, give folks who might wanna contribute public input um, uh, some information about this. So we're gonna use the regular city council rules for public input, um, five minutes per person maximum. If there are more than 20 people waiting, uh, we'll do it three minutes maximum. Um, I do want to remind folks, and this is true across the board with public input, that this is not a time to ask questions of the panel or, or uh, in this case, the other participants. This is a time for you to give input to us about how to make our decision or if you have comments about the HRC in general or the ordinance, um, that's always welcome. Um, but don't expect us to be giving you answers to questions. That's not what public input's about. Um, I do want to also remind you that this is not a meeting of the Human Relations Commission as a whole. I'm the only member here who's on the Human Relations Commission now. Uh, we have two former members, but they're not, they're just here as citizens. Um, so we're happy to take questions about the HRC or take comments, I should say, about the HRC in general or the ordinance, but we're also having a general, uh, our monthly HRC meeting next week. So if you want to hold those questions till then, that would be fine. Um, but again, you're welcome to ask or to pose those if you need. Um, comments um, should be limited to either the hearing, the HRC, or the ordinance in general. If you have questions uh, uh, that you want to pose because you, but you don't have Zoom access, um, we gave uh, Tamara's email address in the uh, invitation, uh, TJ Corbin at urbanillinois.com, and you can email, or, or you've already got, what's that? It's TJ Corbin at urbanillinois.us. Dot US, I'm sorry. I, I auto, auto corrected to uh, dot com. Um, all right, so, um, well, first let me ask, did you get any uh, question, uh, any comments written in? I have not received any at this time. Okay. So uh, looking at the Zoom meeting, I, first person I see using the little hand up uh, button was uh, Tracy Chong. Uh, let me go ahead and unmute Tracy Chong. And um, if I can, yes. And uh, if you want to go ahead, Tracy. Uh, Hi, um, can you guys hear me? Just fine, thank you. Okay, hi, my name is Tracy Chong. I'm resident of Urbana. Um, listening to the points brought up, I am frankly quite disappointed that this special hearing had to happen. Isn't it obvious that the Urbana Human Rights Law should apply to the city and its employees? What other mechanism is in place to remedy situations where residents experience discrimination at the hands of city employees? If I understood correctly, um, Mr. Simon wants Mr. Hansen to seek remedy from outside entities like EEOC. But why? Why doesn't the city feel like they are responsible for addressing their own problems? Here we have City Attorney James Simon presenting his interpretation of the city ordinance that best suits his and his client's interest. I was also aghast at how Mr. Simon proceeded to tarnish Mr. Hansen's character until he was stopped by the chair. I seriously think that the city should look into the ethics of Mr. Simon. It is rather disappointing that this is how the city has chosen to address the problem. I have read through the HR ordinance in my work with advocating for government transparency and accountability, and it was clear to a layperson like myself that it was not intended that the city 
itself and its employees be excluded from the jurisdiction of the HRC. In regards to jurisdiction, Mr. Simon's interpretation of the word other just does not make sense. Why didn't the writers just write in addition to if that's what they really meant? Um, the city website states that Urbana has established three important city units that work together to promote and protect human rights, civil rights, and optimal community relations for Urbana residents, workers, consumers, and visitors. They are the HRC, Civilian Police Review Board, CPRB, and the Human Relations Office, HRO. These are the very checkpoints to ensure our city government is transparent, that employees are held accountable, and residents are not discriminated against. As we have seen unfold in the past few months, a young black woman was brutalized by the police, but no one has been held accountable for the racial injustice. The system is broken. At last night's city council, Scott Dossett, one of the founding members of the CPRB mentioned that there was something wrong with the HRC. The Human Relations Officer plays a vital role here, serving as the staff resource person for the HRC and CPRB. The importance of such a role cannot be taken lightly. If the very entity responsible for, holding these, for upholding these standards is exempt from the ordinance, how will these checkpoints function smoothly? I too have emailed the Human Relations Officer regarding access to city facilities, but never got a response. I've also emailed the Human Relations Officer to submit complaints and ask for confirmation of receipt and what to expect moving forward. The only time this officer responded to my complaint was related to the Aaliyah Lewis incident. As you deliberate, I urge you to not let the city ignore this problem or exempt themselves from the high standards they hold others to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next person I see with their hand raised is, and I hope I pronounced this correctly, Bajal Patel. Um, let me push the unmute button on you. Yeah. I don't be, oh, there we go. Um, oh, uh, go ahead, say, say again. No, I was saying, uh, could you hear me? Yes, fine, thank you. Go okay. right ahead. Thank you. So this is Bito Patel. Uh, I also have lived in Urbana. I think for, for me, it's a little bit briefer, only like four or five years now. Um, so there were two quick comments I wanted to make. So the first one is sort of um, regarding, I mean, the, the whole premise of this conversation is about jurisdiction, right? So the, one of the questions I had is, so we got to a point in our discussion or in, in the panel's discussion where uh, the question was, okay, in the code, there appears to be what, you know, uh, might be posed as an error. And essentially there's a conflict where one section of the code says that, okay, uh, you know, suggests that this is in jurisdiction, one section suggests that it might not be. So I'm wondering, you know, when we have a situation like this where two sections of the code appear to be in conflict, you know, which section do you rely on? And to me, it seems like it'd be logical to look at, okay, what is the intent of the ordinance? And thankfully, the ordinance clearly spells out its intent earlier on. And so at this point, I'd like to basically just read out one of the sections from the ordinance. Um, I've basically used ellipses to shorten it a little bit, but I'm reading only the words that are actually in the ordinance. So the ordinance says that the Commission on Human Relations shall secure, uh, secure the furnishings of equal service to all residents in meeting that need with added service, training city employees to use methods of dealing with intergroup relations uh, which develop respect for equal rights and which result in equal treatment and maintaining equality of opportunity for employment and advancement in city government. So that last part especially seems to me to make it pretty clear that the city has to be regulated by this because how can the Commission on Human Relations maintain equality of opportunity for employment and advancement in city government if the city government is not actually within the jurisdiction of the Commission? So I mean this, this actually wasn't really a point that was brought up in the discussion but it seems to me that this makes it pretty clear that the city government has to be part of the intention. Um, so th that was the first point, and that's kind of the more substantive point. The second point is, um, I agree with the previous uh, commenter that it was actually pretty disappointing to hear um, Mr. Simon complaining about Mr. Hansen in sort of a, in, in sort of a you know, irrelevant kind of way, and more disturbingly saying that the uh, complaint was unfounded while also saying that he has not investigated the complaint. And so, so one of the worst things, in my opinion, is that, you know, I sort of question the wisdom of bringing up the idea that, okay, this will put the commission into untenable position where city employees will not work with the commission in the future. I mean, because I mean, really, that just seems more like sort of a veiled threat that, okay, if you don't rule a certain way, 
then the commission is going to be powerless. I mean, so, so anyway, those are sort of the two points. One is sort of, sort of substantive. The other is more on the tone um, that the city attorney is taking on this. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, let me get back to my window. Does anybody else? I don't see any other raised hand. Oh, there we go. Um, someone uh, who's uh, labeled simply as Roan, I believe. Um, are you there? Uh, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Ron Kester. I live at 1209 West Oregon Street in Urbana. Um, I wasn't intending to speak. Uh, today during participation. I was just wanting to listen, but I just felt outraged by Mr. Simon's representation of the city that I live in. Um, it feels to me like what we've been battling in the city of Urbana has been obfuscation and, and, and roadblocks everywhere the citizens try to take part when it comes to civil rights issues and when it comes to standing up for people who don't have the means to stand up for themselves. And this meeting feels just like such a glaring example of that. So much bile and so much disrespect toward a citizen who has taken it upon himself to try to improve various functions of government and to try to stand up for people who can't stand up for themselves. It felt uh, not just borderline unethical, but a perfect example of somebody who's using his expertise and his knowledge over the years to make an absurd point. And the absurd point is that, the, is that somehow the city officials should be exempt from, human, from uh, being accountable for human rights. Um, that's absolutely um, not what human rights are. The very de definition of rights is that they apply to everybody. Everybody has to be held accountable to them. To say that there's a massive exceptionalism that's built into the spirit of this ordinance is simply wrong. And I hope that, that you all can see through that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next person I see with their hand raised uh, is um, Alex. Um, let me see if I can unmute. I don't seem to be able to. Uh, Jason, if you would. Alex, are you there? That sounds like someone who does not actually want to speak. <laughs> All right, um, the next person I have with a hand raised is Muhammad Wakar Elahi, I believe, if the font looks right. Um, try and unmute you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Uh, hi, this is uh, Muhammad. Uh, I just wanna say that I Lovely. Um, so, uh, and I also saw if, um, Jason, if you could remove from the room Thomas Ross um, Babin down toward the bottom of the list. That would be useful. Um, anybody else with a hand raised who wants to contribute? All right. Well, I think that's the end of public participation. Now um, is a section for the three of us to discuss. Um, I'm happy to take it in either order. Someone want to make a comment or get the discussion started? Well, ordinance is not, not perfect. <laughs> I'm sorry? So the ordinance is not perfect. Right. And we know that. And there are some flaws there, but this is a matter of jurisdiction. So I'm thinking about it. All right, Rizwan. I do think that the city should be held accountable. Whether it is explicitly stated in the ordinance or not, that is debatable. I'm reading it again and again and again, and I can see how um, this 12105 can be interpreted both ways. Um, it is ambiguous, but I would like to 
make that statement. If there is room, if there is ambiguity, if there's room for interpretation, I would like to err on my own behalf on the side of holding the city responsible to the same standard that the city actually expects other people to be held. Now, it's a question of jurisdiction, so that, that <coughs> is more complicated. Whether the interpretation of this 12105D, uh, um, it is not very clear. It is ambiguous. Um, I would, so I serve on the, on the, on the you know, commission. I don't remember seeing a case coming up where, uh, but in the entire history of this ordinance, there must have been other times when something like this must have come up. And I, and I can remember two, the one that Mr. Simon referred to yes, in 2013, and then there was one before that I remember that had to do with a fire department employee. They were both employment questions. And in that case, I believe the, the, um, the determination was let's not make that decision and, and they settled, um, they settled the problem outside of the auspices of the HRC. Um, but the question started to come up as to whether we should take it or not. Um, yeah. But it was never resolved. In the 2013 case, they concluded that it didn't cover it and they dealt with it in some other way. Um, the, the interesting thing to me, just to insert a comment on this, mm -hmm. is, um, you know, I had pointed out those sections where it defines person. And it includes government agency, and so it seems yep. completely silly to include government agency and then say no government agencies are covered by the ordinance. Um, and like you, the, jury, the, the, um, the question of whether Urbana is covered is the one that I think is most ambiguous. If not, it sure looks like it ought to be. But um, that definition is the most interesting because that definition is not used in public accommodations at all, right? Other mm -hmm. things like employ, employment and ownership of property, they use person and government agencies because it contemplates that. But public accommodation, it says, um, that it's either a place, a business, or an individual. Um, and, you know, whereas in person it says a government agency or any um, uh, representative thereof, which an employee of the city for these purposes probably would be, but I'm, I'm having a hard time getting my head around public accommodations. I went and took a look at the state law. And in their section on public accommodations, they have places of public accommodation which looks an awful lot like this, and then separately it talks about government services and government employees as a separate kind of thing. And I, so I'm more concerned about whether the, the city, for this particular purpose, and I think it's much more, uh, it would be a much more complicated discussion if it was about employment at the city, because it does have those clauses about um, making sure that there's equal opportunity for advancement in city government. Clearly some pieces of this ordinance apply to the city, yeah. the things that we're supposed to do. Um, the public accommodation is the weirder one to me. But would somebody not be able to argue that under 12105D, even those do not apply? Right. Right. I think, uh, I think that if, is the ambiguity. If city, if city is able to get out of um, applicability of this ordinance under 12105D, even for employment cases, right. then I think this should be stopped. And, you know, the, the other point along those lines, um, and then I'll stop hogging the mic, is um, the state law on human rights does contemplate municipalities and all sorts of government agencies. I mean, it is very specific that it applies to those things. Um, I mean, some of this indicates that maybe we should be more specific about application and, and update this one way or the other, but that, that there is this remedy, the state, um, uh, Illinois Department of Human Rights, that they are actually told, no, no, you go after cities if they're discriminating, if their employees discriminate um, in the provision of government services. It's crystal clear that that's what they do. Um, yeah. Uh, 
I, I am, like I said, I'm back and forth because of the 12105 thing. It, that word other sure seems like it means other than Urbana, but um, th there's just, it doesn't make it clear anywhere in the article that you should, that the city should get involved in trying to police itself. Remember the, when a complaint does come to the commission, it's not the complainant versus the respondent. It's the city of Urbana versus the respondent. It's like a criminal case. So it would be the city of Urbana versus either the city of Urbana or the employee of the city of Urbana. And I do think the, the way the whole thing is structured would make it very weird. Um, well, either one of you. <clears throat> you know, uh, Pete, uh, the whole process of uh, bringing something before the commission, a complaint, you know, it's got to be investigated. Mm -hmm. I believe Mr. Simon said that you didn't investigate. That's a flaw right there. Right, the, 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 the issue of if you do the investigation, do you stop at jurisdiction if you find no jurisdiction, or do you do probable cause anyway, even if there is no jurisdiction? I would say you do probable cause. Well, so let's take the example. If um, someone from uh, Champaign came over and said, look, I got discriminated against by um, this business over in Champaign, right? I don't think it's unreasonable for the officer to say, look, maybe you did, maybe you didn't, but city of Champaign, we can't go after the city of Champaign. Correct. So I'm just going to say no jurisdiction and not do the probable cause investigation. Would that be okay? Or should they start to investigate that business over in Champaign? They have no jurisdiction in Champaign. Well, and so if Mr. Simon says, look, the city has no jurisdiction against the city employee, should he stop there or should he continue and do the probable cause? I believe because it was a complaint against the city that he should do the probable cause. Interesting. Interesting. So going back to the discussion that we had earlier, at one point I thought when we, somebody was coding that the commission is supposed to work um, in collaboration with the mayor or help the mayor. Mm -hmm. What if it is the mayor himself or herself who is being uh, being, you know, uh, claimed to have discriminated. To, to, to have discriminated. So at some point, I think the the ordinance is going to have these kind of ambiguities because just cannot you cannot devise the language, but that does not mean that the mayor has the complete freedom to discriminate. Well, I mean, we will have to then just come up with a maybe go back to the question of intent. And and then if ambiguity is there. The question to me is if it's the mayor. Yeah. Do, does the HRC want to be on the hook for, in, for doing a hearing there, or do we want to say, no, no, wait a minute. The right place to do things that involve the city is to go to IDHR because they have the tools to do that. And say, we don't have jurisdiction in this case, send it to IDHR. So, and so I guess that's that, a very good point. I think maybe this made me thinking that at what level in the city government, it is possible, okay, you pick the mayor and maybe one or two top layer. At, at some point, we have to draw the line because below that, if we have, if, we, if somebody, if the citizens have to go to that, uh, the state level agency for uh, having felt that they have been discriminated against at a, how many employees are there in the city? Quite, quite a few, right? So, I mean, <laughs> uh, at all level, that, that is, an undue burden, in my opinion. Uh, at the level of the mayor, I'm willing to, to go with that because you know they, the commission, for example, has to work with the mayor, and if, they, if it's the mayor who's on the hook, then send it up. But uh, at what level do we draw the line? Maybe the human relations officer, because of the unique nature of that position, also expects that that should be sent upstairs, as opposed to having to be done <laughs> with, with the same set of people who are dealing with that person day in and day out. Um. I agree with that uh, because the fact is that the mayor appointed Mr. Simon as the investigating officer, is mm -hmm. that correct? 
because the other person was conflicted out. The respondent was, you know, yeah. it would have been the HRO, but yeah. there was a conflict there. So. so I would say any decision that Mr. Salmon made because that other person was uh, conflicted out, that took it away from him. Mm -hmm. What I do not want, whatever the decision is in the end, what I do not want this decision to become a precedent for all the city of Urbana employees to be able to discriminate and not being held responsible. Even if in the end we end up deciding that human relations officer is at the same category as the mayor, for example. I can very easily imagine that the mayor, mayor we may have to just deal in a different way. But somewhere a line must be drawn and that should be quite high up there. And because of the nature of this, um, this particular commission and the officer who works with the commission, it is possible that that person should be, um, uh, there should be a venue and maybe the Human Relations Commission is not the place or the, the subcommittee is not the place. But um, whatever we decide, the language should be very clear that <laughs> The intent, <clears throat> the intent should not be misconstrued. Any other comments? Yeah. Still thinking about it. So I will say that at this point, I am, even with the two previous um, uh, comments that were made, you know, the two cases in 2013 and previous, I don't remember what year it was, um, I am having a hard time convincing myself that 12105 excludes the city instantly because there are too many pieces of the ordinance that it clearly includes the city um, and on discrimination complaints. Um, on the particular, whether the particular person here, um, whether the provision of services in a fair way falls under the ordinance, I could see employment. I could see real estate stuff if the city was discriminating in real estate transactions that the HRC might be able to hear that if the city was discriminating employment decisions that we could hear that and I, I think I disagree with Mr. Simon's assessment that you know it would somehow be um, you know impossible to work together if that were the case um, but with regard to whether um, and in this case it's basically is this person performing their duties fairly? Are they treating the public differently because of race or because of anything else? Um, I, I, boy, I'm not sure that, it's not clear to me that that's in our scope. Um, and again, if I felt like there was no other avenue I might say, well, benefit of the doubt the other way, but especially because the state law is crystal clear that they deal with government employees, and this one isn't, I'm, I'm almost inclined to say, let the state handle this because that is in their mission, and it's not clear that it's in the HRC's mission. That, that's how I'm currently leaning. Not an ideal decision either way. I agree. I don't like the state of the ordinance. It's a mess. Any more conversation or should we take a vote here? I think we should take a vote. <clears throat> Rizwan, you prepared to vote? All right, um, so uh, the votes will be uh, jurisdiction or no jurisdiction. And, uh, and mind you, if it's uh, jurisdiction, then what we're basically asking is for Mr. Simon to go back and do the probable cause finding. Um, and then it may come back to us again um, or some other panel of similar nature. Um, so, uh, Marion? No jurisdiction. There is one? I think there is jurisdiction. 
I should have done it in the other order. <laughs> I'm glad you did this <laughs> the way you did. I, I think um, on the basis of the, of the public accommodation issue, I'm, I'm going to vote no jurisdiction. Um, so the vote is two to one, no jurisdiction. What I'd like to do at that point is um, I want to collect together our thoughts. I'll send some email to each of you, and I'll prepare an order um, that there is no jurisdiction. And I, I do want to include all of, I mean, I think each of us had our concerns that it could have gone either way. Um, at this point, um, so there are two things right now that we normally talk about when there's a finding of no jurisdiction. First of all, um, I want to note for you that uh, you do have the right to, um, uh, from Section 12102, any person suffering a legal wrong or adversely affected or aggrieved by an order or decision of the Commission um, uh, can file a complaint with Sixth Circuit. So um, you can do that. Um, the other thing, and I think um, the HRO if in this position of no jurisdiction would make a similar recommendation, is IDHR is a good jurisdiction for this, right? They specifically say that they will um, conduct investigations in municipalities, and I think you properly would have gotten the recommendation to go talk to them about a complaint um, uh, with regard to an employee of the city and they will certainly not have a jurisdictional issue there. Um, the, the probable cause issue, will, you, you'll have the discussion with them about that if you want to. Um, but those are recommendations. I'm glad to talk to you after the hearing um, if you want to discuss ins, outs, and possibilities. Um, but the finding of the panel is, uh, at this point, no jurisdiction. Um, and so we'll, uh, we'll, I'll prepare an order to that effect and we'll go from there. All right. Um, I would, can I just make one comment? Go so right ahead, of, you know, please. Completely independent of what we discussed. I think next week meeting at the, with the HRC, um, uh, uh, I, th I think <coughs> this should be taken up and cleaned up. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think the HRC should make some recommendations to the city about cleaning up the, these ambiguities in the ordinance yeah. because um, and, and really, the, the city council might decide, look, we want these things to go to IDHR, but then make that clear that Urbana is not subject to these particular rules. I wouldn't have a problem recommending that employment might be subject to, but um, because that excludes all of the officers who are appointed. That's just about employment per se. And because, you know, these things come up, these hearings take place, this is public information, are we giving license? Exactly. To, to Urbana employees to continue. A and that would be deeply problematic. To, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so. Uh, Any other comments before we adjourn? Thank you all for attending. Thank you for uh, uh, um, taking your time. And uh, we are adjourned.